What is up, everybody? Thank you so much for joining me. I'm back. Y'all like, y'all cannot get rid of me. No, you cannot. Plus, I'm coordinating with my guests tonight. We coordinating. If you didn't know about wearing this royal color, you're going to learn why tonight. So everybody, thank you so much for joining me. We are in the midst or the very beginning, the very first week of Women's History Month 2023. I am so excited because we did, we're doing something different this year over here at Positive Hire. But for tonight's session, we're talking about entrepreneurship, scaling up how Black woman tech owner grew an e-commerce six-figure revenue. Um, and so I want to introduce you to a good friend of mine we met a few years ago. Her name is Karen Eason. She's a startup business strategist. She specializes in sparking mindset shifts needed to help women use their God-given gifts to build profitable, passion-based business that creates a positive impact. She coaches and she helps consultants and coaches tired of trying to figure it out on their own to get out of their heads. Like we get stuck, right? And she helps us get unstuck and into action to figure out to finish what they start and see results finally, because you can be spinning your wheels for a while. Her clients bridge the gap from where they are confused, frustrated, and overwhelmed to really having clarity, simplification, and magnification in their messaging and momentum. Karen has over 30 years of entrepreneurship experience is a LinkedIn business mentor and is currently pursuing her doctoral degree in operations and management with an emphasis in entrepreneurship. So if you want to stop spinning your wheels and save yourself time, energy, and money, turn your business jigsaw puzzle into a profitable masterpiece. You have to stick around as I have this conversation with this Virginia State University graduate, Sigma <laughs> Gamma Rho, right? Sigma Gamma Rho. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, marching band. Don't forget the marching band. I didn't know about the, Oh, I'm learning yeah. something. Can you tell me about the marching band? <laughs> well, I'm learning some new stuff tonight. But she is also a Brooklyn native. Don't get it twisted. She a Brooklyn native. So, Karen, welcome, welcome tonight for this special conversation. How are you? Thank you. Welcome. I appreciate the welcome um, and I appreciate the invite and for you having me. I'm doing great. I am here with Michelle Hayward. I mean, anytime I can hang out with you is a good time. So I'm happy. <laughs> okay. So what did I leave out? Like what, what else? Like we just learned you was in the marching band because I didn't know that she yeah. had that in there, but she also, I don't remember you was having a conversation about you being in the marching band. But what else did I leave out? What else did I, what, what else do I need to do? The people need to know. Oh man. Um, I'll, I'll just, I'll add that I have experience um, in almost every functional area of business. So that's operations, that's human resources, that is um, customer service or leading customer service accounting. Um, I was an accountant for several years. I led HR initiatives, organizational change. So it's kind of like from the Rudy to the Tootie <laughs> when it comes to business, finance, accounting, all of that. I have three degrees, um, programming, which that's why you always tell you, that's one of the reasons you always say I'm tech, right? I have a uh, business information degree, bachelor's, and then I have another one in accounting with a minor in finance and master's in organizational leadership. And I'm, um, as you said, pursuing my PhD. So um, like I said, Rudy to the tootie. <laughs> okay. So I, I want to go back to this um, bachelor's of information systems. And let's really just talk about what is that? Because it's been a few years since you got it, but it it is really how you're you're able to move and build out the e-commerce platform in the early 2000s. That is true. So um, out of, so here, here's the story behind that. I always wanted to be a fashion designer 
when I was growing up and in high school. And I, in high school, I used to design my um, friends' evening gowns. I wanted to do evening gowns. So, um, and then the Commodore 64 came out, for those of you that are old enough to remember it. <laughs> but it didn't have any instructions, right? Like we, everybody wanted this, but nobody knew how to make it do what it's supposed to do. Um, and so I took a basic programming course in high school. And I said, hey, this is pretty cool. So my goal was to finish school, go to college, get the degree in computer programming that would allow me to make good money. And then I was going to go to school at night for the passion, which was um, fashion design and coordination. Uh, long story short, once I got that degree, that was it. I never uh, went back for fashion design, but that degree taught me coding. I learned, it's, it's almost like hidden figures in real life. I learned COBOL, Fortran, Assembler, which are all computer languages down to the zeros and ones, um, as well as C, C+, I think maybe C++, and of course, BASIC. So I also learned systems architecture, which allowed me to um, take a computer apart, build it, and then also go to someone's business, which was part of um, one of the course requirements, and to um, make suggestion on what type of computer system would help their business out. So that's what my degree taught me. I'm, I'm sitting over here. She gave me nightmares about when you said basic, because basic all capital letters is a period between each one of the letters. Don't get it confused because y'all be like, oh, you mean, nope, not that basic. Like if you took basic, you know, if you don't know, you think you, you know. Um, and you said Fortran, I took Fortran 77. And it was like those language basic in high school, Fortran 77 in college. And I went in the 90s. I'm done. It's like, yeah, let me go on over to the civil engineering building down this hill over here. I'm good. I'm good. So so you you had the basics. You're like, ooh, I'm going to make this. Like you had a plan at 18 on mm -hmm. how you make your money, how you was going to make your money. Mm -hmm. And where the money resides, where the money. And, and even back then, you knew it was in tech. I did. I did. Um, and it still is in tech. It's never left tech. <laughs> it's never left tech. Okay. So you have the skill set. You have this knowledge. This is nine. This is in the eighties. So you did some stuff in the nineties. We ain't going to talk about why we got bad knees right now. Nine now, 2000. When, <laughs> tell us about the business. Tell us about what the business was and like, how did you get to, to purchasing a business? Um, I actually worked there. <laughs> I think that's probably one of the best ways to get to know a business. And so um, what happened was I came, so I, I went to school, obviously in Virginia. I um, got married, lived in Hawaii for several years. And then I came back to New York and as I was searching, I ended up working for this company that did like novelty items and jewelry. And um, that was where I became director of operations, right? And so in doing that, I was after a few other jobs in management and operations. But this one in particular, I oversaw the manufacturing of the products, the accounting unit, sales. Um, that was a big one. Oh, I forgot to tell you about that one too. Yeah, that's the other part of Rudy to the Tootie. Um, I've been in sales since I was probably 17 or 18, if not before that. But I digress. And so um, that, that business, we did trade shows. Um, that's where bulk of the money was made, um, probably the first three or four months of the year. But uh, we really needed to innovate. And so the owner had um, mental health issues. And there became a time where she was absent from the business and I was running it. And eventually she just needed to focus full time on her health and turn the business over to myself primarily. And then there were some other um, individuals 
that stayed on and became sort of like junior partners. And so that's pretty much how I acquired the business. I was already in it as a operations manager and then the opportunity arose. And so uh, the moral of the story is you don't have to build from scratch. You can always um, look at what's already available and what fits your skills, talents, and abilities and learn it, learn about it. And then if it's a good fit, work in magic and take over one of the, a business that's already been built. Leverage what other people had to figure out. I love that. I love that taking the foundation and of a house as, since I'm a civil engineer and building upon it, it has some frames, but it it is solid. It's it's sturdy, but you know you can you can do more to the property um, and grow from there. I, I love that. So here you are with an already staffed business, mm -hmm. already have a customer base, mm -hmm. already have a product, have brand awareness. You, you like, you already got some funnel already done. So if you don't know the funnel, that's okay. That's okay. Um, but you, I want to go back because um, I see Giselle already, um, Giselle's in a comment. And I want to talk about this a bit, acquire what is, uh, is already built, preach. But Giselle is a friend of ours. And she started like you started in business um, year 30. She started her business 30 plus years ago. And so ground game and air game is what she calls it. So <laughs> yeah. You're talking trade shows and different. Let, let's get into sales because I think this is a, a hindrance for some business owners, especially in this online age, mm -hmm. understanding sales and understanding ground game sales, not online marketing, not ads or digital ads, but really talking sales 30, because it still works. Mm -hmm. it's, you still make your money. Let's talk sales, because I'm, I'm going to jump ahead, because I want to get into the sale. So if y'all got other questions, let me know. Michelle want to know the sales part in this ground game. So you were talking trade shows. Mm -hmm. Tell us about how did this company originally start before you build out the e-commerce? Like, how were you making sales and what how, and what did that look like? So before we talk about the company, I want to talk about my personal sales experience because okay. I think that it's a it's a great foundation. And um, this particular method takes a hit a lot in, in the larger community. So my very first, I'll say, business was I was a Mary Kay a makeup consultant, right? Not because I wanted to build a business. I just wanted discounts on what I was going to use. And so the way to get the discounts was to buy the product and then sell some and then keep what I needed. Right. Yep. And so, um, network marketing, I've always been, um, you know, adjacent to network marketing or in it in some form or fashion. I've done quite a few over the years from the time I was young until, you know, not too long ago, actually. So I've done insurance, I've done, um, legal services, I've done um, makeup, I've done telecommunications back back in the day when you needed to have a little code and card in order to do long distance phone calls. And so they give a really good foundation for selling. Um, and I think that uh, they teach you about make, uh, covering objectives and the what's in it for them and um, highlighting the, the sizzle from the steak and, and all of these really sound um, techniques. So when I was doing prepaid legal, I did prepaid legal for a while. And ground game meant that you're out there talking to people, right? You, you meet someone on the bus, you, you're striking up a conversation, um, talking about uh, how how do they have legal services if they wanted to buy a house? What type of attorney would they use? Um, and, and some of those ground game methods that I use to even get people to come to events where I could then have a, um, a list uh, in order to call, write a prospect list. Listen, we would do events. We would get big giant posters made from the um, printing company 
and staple them one side to the other around a pole on the street, staple it, and we would go up and down like where like Brooklyn, right? Downtown Brooklyn. We would staple them around the poles where people would see them near bus stops and high traffic areas with a, a phone number, an 800 number for them to call. They get registered and now they're on my prospect list. So ground game uh, in that business also included, as you talked about, trade shows. So going to a trade show. So trade shows have a very special method you're exposed to a large number of people in a short period of time. And so you've got to get your messaging quick, like 10, 20 seconds, because if you've ever gone someplace and, and you're walking by and someone's trying to talk to you and try to get your attention, that has to be compelling quickly. Your signage, your display has to be on point because if they're walking by, You've got to catch their eye on your signage and your product display for them to stop. So that's that's so product design, your signage, your 30 second, uh, we, we call it a snap, but I'm going to say your 30 second pitch, why they should stop and give you any more of their time because there's 900 other booths that they need to get to see, right? But location, location, location. So trade shows uh, kind of mimic real estate, which I also did, um, where it's location-based. So if you're in the back in the corner, you, your booth is back in the corner because probably you don't have a relationship with the trade show host, yep. um, number one, or you're new to the trade show. So they're not going to give you prime space. They're going to give you, they're going to give that to people that have been with them longer. So you can't stay in the corner. You've got to have people with you or you. Yeah. One person's at the booth, the other person is out there on the floor. You've got to have brochures. So again, ground game. We had brochures, flyers, postcards. We did um, uh, bulk mailing out to yeah. our um, customer base. We had jars with candy to get people to give us their business cards so we could then add them to the mailing list to then send brochures and contact them and call them. That's ground game. Ground game is reaching out, standing out, being in front of them. Um, my booth is in the back in the corner. Well, guess what? I'm out at the front where they're coming in, passing out my card and my brochure saying, hey, blah, 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 blah. I might even have a few samples. You got to give them a taste, right? This is what we have. Go over there, the blah, blah, blah. So you have to, when you've got ground game, I think ground game is so important and it's lost now. And people that are, I'll say at least Gen X, we're not used to air game. Air game takes us out because we're used to the touchy feely. Let me, let, let me call you and say, what's going on? We've adapted because we are children of the age that brought in that saw the emergence of com personal computers, yeah. right? So we're, we're like, they, they call us the lost generation because nobody really pays attention to us. But it's in the understanding that we can leverage technology yep. and marry it to what we already know. That's where everybody gets lost. We get lost trying to do this air game because that's not us. That's for the millennials. They grew up with air game, so they're good at it. We grew up, you know, if we look at basketball, right, we grew up seeing Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bernard King and all of them in real shorts, <laughs> them gym shorts, basketball shorts. <laughs> Not these, you know, long shorts and which you got your own sneaker brand. Listen, they was wearing 69 is playing basketball when we grew up. But we get to marry air game and ground game, as Je as uh, Giselle would say. And yes, Gen X, we are high touch. We want to, we want that connection. And so that's probably why it's so difficult for us, um, because we have to figure out how to build connection in a disconnected medium that's supposed to bring relationships and make them easier, but it doesn't. I, I love that. Um, you talked about even bad positioning and location 
it's at a trade show it's still about location 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 people knowing who you are right just because you're on the internet doesn't mean people know who you are um mm -hmm. and so that people like but i have i have an instagram page yeah but what you doing on there everything looks the same is monochromatic who are you talking to yourself because every time i read your captions it's about you and it's not about the person you're trying to sell to and and so you hit so many points on there and so we're going to come back to this but you got the you have the business it's a ground game business mm -hmm. what the the owner of the company like I, I need to leave because i need to take care of myself first which is really important any business owner, owner, any founder, please take care of your mental health first because mm -hmm. nothing else can happen without you. And so here you are mm -hmm. with this business. And what are you what are you saying to yourself? Like, Lord, what did I what did I decide? What what am I doing? <laughs> Honestly, it was not even a, a thought in my mind. It was like, just keep doing what you're doing, girl. You got it, you know, go. Um, you know, it, it's, it's kind of different because I think when you, when you have college education, you kind of think to, which is incorrect, but this is kind of what people do. You think that, okay, I have all this education. So business is supposed to be easy. Right. Um, I took, the, I took marketing class. I, <laughs> I took a management class. I'm good. And guess what? You get slapped in the face and you are awoke real quickly when you begin to really have to deal with business. Now, again, I was already in the business as a manager, right? As director of operations. So I at least had a frame of reference and I knew what to keep doing and I knew what I needed to shift or work on. So sales was one of those things that um, we had to be innovative, but we didn't have a lot of money. So what did we do? We brought in college interns, sat them, we, we gave them a desk, gave them some phones. Like, listen, I need you to start calling these people and see if we can get some orders from them. So um, it's the innovation and the creativity and the problem solving. Uh, if you are, good at those things, then you just need to focus on that. And where, where, you're, where you're not, uh, something I learned in uh, network marketing was recruit your weakness. Yes. So where I wasn't good at um, certain things, I recruited my weakness because that meant that in areas where I wasn't strong, they were and vice versa. And so you know, that's, see, that's what building team is all about. See, people don't get that. Uh, you hear that now. Oh, everybody, you need a team, build team. They tell you get a team, but they're not telling you how to build an effective team. An effective team is a team that covers all the areas that you can't. The two of you should not be excellent at the same thing. Yes. That's redundancy. What you need are people that can, bridge bridge the gaps that you have so that you are stronger 360 not 180 not 45 not 90 so that's that's how you build a team you build a team that plugs in the holes where you have gaps okay see I, we got, we got to stop here cuz there's two things i want to talk about Oftentimes, I get a lot of founders, especially in the tech space, like, I'm going to hire somebody to do sales. Oh, like, well, you ain't sold nothing yet. <laughs> so can we talk about, can we, can we have, can, let's have a moment. Okay, we, got, we had a quiet moment because we were praying for y'all. Let's talk <laughs> about, number one, when they should be hiring people, Right. Cause they're like, oh, we're gonna. I'm hard because I don't do good at sales. Well, how do you know? How do you? And so, can we talk a bit about sales and and because like, well, she said, but she ain't say everything. Y'all gotta buy. Y'all gotta pay for some stuff. 
But let's talk because I get this pushback. I'm just hyped, like, you don't know who you selling to. You don't know what you need to be saying. You don't you haven't found out what their pain point is or pain points are. Mm -hmm. You're making assumptions. So before you spend 40, 50, 60, 100 thousand dollars on a salesperson, can we have a conversation, Karen? About um, about sales, <laughs> bringing in a salesperson when you're gonna hire the salesperson. How about you making <laughs> hundred thousand dollars before you paying somebody a hundred thousand dollars that's the first thing <laughs> sorry i'll keep it real um so so here's the thing about when to bring in sales right you got to know your product inside out if you are in the startup stage um and and you are not nine thousand percent clear on every aspect of your product and delivery, then you really don't need to be bringing anybody else in because you need to know it first. If you don't know it, how can you effectively train someone else? Because there are a myriad of different ways and selling techniques and methods, right? And if you are bringing someone in First of all, that their method needs to be in alignment with your brand, your product, your service, and your whole persona. It's, it's got to connect to your ideal clients, avatars. It's got to do all of that. And so first thing you need is alinity. If there is no alinity, then you're going to be wasting money because a person is not going to produce the way you want them to or the way that they should. Um, so first you need to know your product inside and out like there it should just roll off the back of your tongue it's, it needs to be subconscious competence right so we four levels of competency you need to be at level four subconscious competence like walking you don't even think about walking right um then from there you've got to look at what do you have in your budget because and is that money best spent on sales? So if it is, then you need to work with sales professionals that align with your brand, your reputation, and all of that that I just said. And then lastly, you've got to figure out, well, where are you going to find these people? Because I'll tell you, we had sales reps that went out, they had, we gave them sales kits. They had order sheets, they had display kits, they had all of that. And they went out and they went to different stores. So we had sales reps. And then we also had college, right? To do the phone sales on, on the phone. So you've got to figure out where is your customer? Are they best connected to by phone? Are they best connected by in-person door-to-door -door sales? Yeah. I've done that. Listen, I've sold vacuum cleaners door to door where uh, back in the day, you know, used to the, used to see the commercial where the guy or the movie where the guy would come in. He would he ring the doorbell, open the lady, open the door and he throw dirt <laughs> in the, uh, on her floor. And then that's how he'd get in to clean it up to sell a vacuum. I've done that. I've done telemarketing sales. I've done um, in-person sales. I've sold newspaper subscriptions where... <laughs> So you can't be afraid to get hung up on, but if you don't have that, that um, experience, right, that you can live through and draw upon, then how are you going to train your people to make sure that your sales are the best? I love it. Thank you. Thank you for breaking that down and taking us through. I, all I'm going to say, I'm going to leave it. Leave yeah, what Karen said, and I'm gonna leave that alone because I be having these conversations every week, but mm -hmm. not quite every day. So now we got the sales, you have the company and you brought in the interns, they're doing those those dials for you. What might have been no at this point, y'all ain't doing rotary and um <laughs> oh, they was, they was touch yeah, they, they was touch tone. Cause and, and that's called a landline for the young lady over on TikTok. That's like if it was a phone in the house for everybody that's a landline right. and so karen here we are you have the you bought in you know you you're i agree as a business owner as a founder being creative 
and really being able to solve problems. And I get this. So we both get this, right? Well, I don't know. And like, well, why didn't you do this? This is like, oh my God, I'm so glad I talked to you. And sometimes you're just stuck because you're doing so much. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you just get people who don't know how to solve problems. And mm -hmm. so here we are. You're like, okay, I got the business. It's doing this well. Um, what? How do, how do you get to e-commerce? Because this is what year? What year is this? I don't know, late 80s? I don't know, probably late 80s, early 90s? Somewhere in there. With the, with the company you're working for and the, and the owner, owner mm -hmm. has yeah. some, it was the late 80s, late mm -hmm. 80s or late, late 90s? No, no, it wasn't late nineties. I don't, I, you know, it's been so long. I can't, I can't calculate back that far. Um, let me see. No, no, you're right. No, it's probably mid, mid to late nineties. You're right. It wasn't late eighties. Right. Okay. Mid, mid to I tried to do the math. I was like, when was I in high school again? Is <laughs> <laughs> that I graduate college again? Yeah, somebody says, thanks for clarifying. Like, when do you hire? When do you hire? Um, and and so we it's it's so much around hiring that we could go into that's like a whole six hour discussion, but we're not gonna get into that in this in this conversation. But I do, did definitely want to talk about it. So mm -hmm. here you are in the mid to late 90s. Mm -hmm. The owner of the business has to walk away, has to mm -hmm. leave. You have this team, you have customers, you have, you're generating revenue. How does e-commerce come up? Because it's a 9, 9, 2000, 98, 97, 90. You know, right. what's going on? So it was about expansion. I mean, we're trade shows can only go but so far. I mean, we did the bulk of our yearly sales within the first three to four months of the year. So January to March, sometimes you can slide to April, but primarily it was January to March. We were at all the trade shows. We were never home. We were in Vegas and Dallas and Orlando, Orlando, I think it was the, the magic show. We had this show here in New York, um, Cali, Seattle. Um, so we were always on the road, LA. Um, we did gift shows. We did all different types of shows, right? So the, the trade show that you're able to get into, it has to align with your product as well. Um, the good thing for us is that we were able to go into different, uh, several different type of shows. And from beauty to gift shows to um, general merchandise and even fashion, right? So we were able to kind of cascade into any area. Um, and so it was about expansion. And it started with us getting the UPC code done. So the barcodes that you see now that are so prevalent, um, back then they were there, but everyone wasn't putting barcodes on their products. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to get into large chains like Walmart. And um, I know Walmart for sure was one that we were looking at trying to get into and, and then some department stores, right? In the fashion items. And so they were like, a requirement is you've got to have um, barcodes. Okay, what do we do? We had to deal with, we had to get, I think we had to create the program in order to, because there's a certain way to generate a barcode, right? So each of those numbers in order uh, represent a style and a this and a that and a color and all these things. So we had to create the code. Then we had to um, get software to generate the code. And then you had to register. I think the company was in Canada, the UPC Universal Products, I think it's commission, UPC, um, in order to get your general, um, like the first part of your barcode and then the rest of it is like your SKU and all of that. So we had to do all of that in order to get into a larger chains. And then it was, well, we're selling to, we were B2B, business to business. But the goal was, okay, how can we leverage this one so that we're not taking phone calls all day long? So the initial goal was to build out a B2B website where our um, customers could come in, go on, to, go online. And again, this was in the this was the beginning, right? Everything was supposed to be moving online. Before then, people were ordering from us through our brochures and catalog, right? Everybody, I mean, I had a 
big mailbox center and I, we had slots. It was like 24 mailbox center and we had all slots, all different kinds of catalogs because that's how you ordered back then. So we, um, we did the UPC code and then we did the website. So we embraced technology to make our, our business um, easier to manage um, and faster for our customers to order. Yes. And so what we did was we built the business to business side first and it was like, okay, that way people don't have to call and wait, you know, cause you, we had music on hold <laughs> and that was a big, you know, to do, we got a, a, a voice system that was several thousands of dollars. And one of the modules was music on hold, right? Because we need to keep people on the phone holding until we could get to take their order. So why should we do that? We could just build a website. So that's what we did. Then we had individuals. We said, okay, well, let's build a B2C. So now, but we had to be careful because when, you, when you're selling B2B and B2C, you cannot undercut your um, distributors because we had distributors and we had um, individual mom and pop businesses. So our distributors bought high volume and then we had our regular B2B customers. And then we decided to go to um, individual sales. So we, we had a three pronged approach to gaining customers. Um, and then we had sales reps and all that other stuff. I'm just sitting here like I remember calling in orders or seeing my mom call in the JC Penny or whatever or doing an order form and mailing it off. But yeah, it depends on how much stuff because I come from a family of five kids, so it could be a long list. So sometimes you need to go get more. Go go find the other the other order form from the other JC Penny because we got mm -hmm. we got a lot of stuff we need to order because I am trying to get clothes if I can. So I'm I'm over here cracking up just reliving my childhood. Yeah, they have spring catalog, summer catalog, yes. winter catalog, and fall catalog, and you had to hold on to them at least until the next um, that next season because yep. there it wasn't there wasn't any place else you could go. There was no online. It was just starting, and so being at the forefront of using technology to make the business more profitable, right? It's more yeah. profitable for them to go online and place a reorder than for me to pay someone to sit on the phone to take an order. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, we've been talking about AI and what jobs are going to go away with AI. So you got to think about it. Call centers and catalogs, really catalogs pretty much are not, non-existent. Um, I still we still get a few from like Uline or whatever, but then call centers really now are customer service, mm -hmm. but it's not to take orders the same way. It's like my phone is broken, my service is out, right? And so it's different. And so you have to think about what does that look like. So how long? Um, we have a question for you. How long did it take for you to realize the sales system? Um. It was over probably three or four years because we were already doing phone sales. And of course we were doing trade shows. So once we started looking at, um, and then we started bringing in distributors, right? So, so here's the thing, at the trade shows, we would meet distributors and distributors would say, hey, I love your product. I wanna, um, can I distribute it? So now, of course, distributors get a lower price because they're going to turn around and distribute to um, a smaller business, right? And then the business is going to turn around and sell it to the end customer. So distributors had the lowest price, but of course, we made that up in volume. So trade shows not only got us regular B2B customers, it brought in distributors. So that was huge. And when you have distributors and they're working for you, Right. And then you're bringing in and, and sometimes at trade shows you would find or meet, we would meet sales reps. I can take your product and I can I can get out there. And, uh, so when you have those people, they sort of push you into 
um, innovating, I would say, or being creative. Because if they if they tell me I've got an order for 30 kits, we're excited. 30 kits? Yes. You know, we had piece, we had kits that were pieces um anywhere from 36 pieces to over 244 pieces. So if you're telling me you've got an order for uh 20 or 30 244 piece kits, I'm ecstatic. But guess what? That's not a regular mom and pop shop. Mm -hmm. That's a chain store, right? That might have been a um a pharmacy or whatever. And so it's important to pay attention when orders are coming in, where they're coming in, the volume, because that dictates um, when you scale and when you expand. And so the sales system expanded um, from trade shows to distributors. Then we, we brought in the sales reps. And then I had the college interns being internal phone sales um, because it was free. They got credit and then I could free up my staff to do more important things like Michelle said, like customer service. So um, that iteration was over probably the four years after I took over. I love it. I love it. So I want to go into the tech side because, you know, we're going to find, because you, you focus on the product, you focus on the customer, you focus on sales, right? And I'm not going to talk about product right now. We're going to leave that alone. But we're going to talk about the new product, the tech product. Now you have the UPC. You, you want to go to individuals and you're like, okay, I got to get this e-commerce side of this business up and running. What was your process as far as you can recall going through and, and figuring out what, what would that look like to build out e-commerce for the company? Wow. Um, so it started with the idea, hey, <laughs> Websites are the thing. <laughs> let me get, let, let's build up a website. Uh, and then from there, it went to, okay, who is going to program this site? Because there were no plug and play modules back then. Now you can just, you know, throw up a website, drag and drop. Um, no, that had to be coded. And so we found a programmer Um and that's where my background in uh, programming was helpful because even though I didn't do coding, as Michelle always says, I, I was able to interface with him and understand what he was telling me, right? And so it went from the idea to getting the programmer. And then from there, it was schematics. Like, what do we want it to look like? Um, we're going to put up this store, right? We put up the, the e-commerce store. Um, what is the front end look like? We had pictures of each item. And then, you know, like now it, it's, it's like a no brainer. People just go to Shopify or wherever and the store is, you know, you pick a template. But back then we had to design every aspect of the front end and the back end. So on the back end, it was like, um, how, how many characters, how wide is the column? Um, are we gonna put a picture here? Where's the menu gonna be? What's the menu gonna look like? I mean, to, to talk about designing something, like if you were to, if you go online and look at anyone's e-commerce store, that had to be, that had to be programmed and coded. And what I mean by that is everything you see the placement of it, the color, the field width, the the um, the ability for you to have a long name, a short name, an item description, a dollar amount to calculate the tax, all of that someone coded. That's where we were back then. Now you can just open up a, a, a software package and it and you just put in the information and it does the rest. So that process was really. Um, really design heavy and I've designed I've designed two accounting systems and then these two e-commerce sites and so my background in IT allowed me to understand it and to work with the programmers to create the vision for what what we wanted it to look like so 
I love this ideation utilizing some of that college knowledge because we think because we went to college, we know everything. We don't know nothing. We just know what was in that book, what was on the test, what we what was on our calculator. Um, but we also have real, real world experience from um, jobs to me have worked. And somebody like, well, I've only done McDonald's. It's like, you're the cashier, you work the fries. This is like the cashier. I said, that's customer success. You know how to talk to customers. Let me tell you, it's not a lot of founders, not a lot of business owners that know how to talk to customers. We wow. see that we 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 are the customer, right? We we run into people or they don't know how to train their teams to talk to customers too. I think Chick-fil-A and um one really great hotel in Disney, they do really great jobs training their people to talk to their customers. Not not many people. So it's so many so many things you went through there. But when you said you describe what you had to build, everything that had to be coded to what you can just do now in WordPress and a theme, unless mm -hmm. you want something very particular, you literally are up and running in 30 days. How long? <laughs> and that's because you want, that's because you're hiring somebody. To, oh, I don't like the way that looks. Can we make the font <laughs> longer? Yeah, that's Times New Roman. Who uses Times New Roman? I yeah. use yeah, I, I use Google fonts and use this. Like, you're sitting here today like, oh, my God, tech has come so long since I built this company 30 years or 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. And going, what are y'all complaining about? <laughs> that part. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh, ooh, listen, I, you know, I, I, I talked about um, hidden figures, right? Yep. Um, and what was that? I didn't see the movie when it first came out. I saw it like later, right? But what, what always stands out for me is when, um, I think it's Octavia Spencer, learns COBOL, yep. right? She learns the language because of the mainframe computer, and there are punch cards in there. When I learned COBOL, I learned, and probably the other ones too, um, we had punch cards. They're probably the size of your cell phone, a little bit bigger. They were like cream color. And they had zeros and ones and some numbers or whatever. And you sat at what looked like a typewriter and you typed your line of code into the typewriter and it punched it into the card. And then you, you had to aggregate because each card is one line of code. So you had to aggregate hundreds of cards, take it to the computer lab for the mainframe to run it. And it would spit out this green and white huge computer paper yep. and it would tell you your code and then it would do whatever it was supposed to do and if it worked you got what you were supposed to get if it didn't you had to figure out what was wrong remove that punch card put in a new punch type out a new one to replace it go back to the computer lab wait two hours or more to get your output so that's the difference between <laughs> That's the difference between what we had to build back then to you go, you didn't even have to go, to, listen, you don't even have to go to Staples anymore. Remember that when you had to go to Staples to buy a computer program? Now you just download it from the internet. Like everything has changed so much. When I was an accountant, I learned accounting manual. We had journal entries. We yeah. had... Um, the lined column paper, we had uh, main journals, subsidiary journals, and you did it by hand in pencil. You added up the columns. And if you missed a number, you had to re-add that column, put the thing at the bottom. And then once you did the total there, you had to carry it over to the main journal. You don't do it anymore. You don't even hardly use accounting programs anymore in terms of actually having to download a program. Yep. When I had that business, we were using Peachtree Accounting, which was the standard then. Now people are like, who? Peachtree is no longer Peachtree. It's called Sage Accounting. And everyone has gone on to QuickBooks. When I'm, I'm not going to talk about QuickBooks. But um, <laughs> the iterations um, between then and now is like, you know, our parents would say, oh, you've got, everything is so much easier for you. I mean, it, it really 
is no excuse because the excuse is, is the issue here. It's, it's not in the resources or the materials or the tech. Yep. Woo. Okay. So you have this e-commerce platform because we only have, I, I'm going to keep us as much on schedule because, you know, I get to talk to you all the time. They don't get to talk to you. Okay. So I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a up to three in the morning talk, finish it up. So if y'all got questions, I suggest y'all get them in because, yo. Okay. So you have the e-commerce side of the business up and running. Mm-hmm. How is business going like? Because this is the early 2000s. So we had the dot, dot com bust. We have been through 9-11. You're in New York. What is, how, how is business like? What, what's going on? So, you know, interestingly enough, the dot-com bust did not impact us at all, really. Um, because I think because we had established customer base and they preferred being able to, you know, utilize the internet. It was the new, you know, end thing. And they were able to, it was more efficient and effective, right? They could, we had pre-designed kits that they could order, um, you know, this color, multicolor, whatever it was. And so they could just go pick what they wanted and be on their merry way. We'd get the order, we, you know, pack it, ship it, and, and everything is done. Um, so we didn't have that problem. What hit us hard um, was 9-11. Um, And, you know, everyone has their where I was when 9-11 happened. But for me, it was it's even more visceral because we were doing a trade show in New York. I mean, I lived in Brooklyn at the time in New York. Right. And but we were doing a trade show. And when I was getting ready, um, we have a channel that, you know, like all news network and so the first plane hit the tower and I was like, what movie is that? And eventually I realized, oh my God, this is not a movie. And my first instinct was to get to the Javits Center because that's where the trade show was, which is in Manhattan on 34th Street. Why? I don't know. But it it was kind of like, I got to go protect my business. I got to get there. And so eventually it, it was just became clear. So I I jumped up, I got dressed and I jumped in my car and I was driving towards the office. And it was really like a scene out of the movie. You ever seen those movies where like, like is the aliens, right? They're coming and then all the cars stop and people get out and they're looking up. Like that is literally what happened. We're seeing all the smoke and everything. And then all of a sudden, the top half of the tower falls and all, all of our cars just stopped and we just looked. And I remember I just burst into tears. All I could think about was, oh my God, all the people that were in there. And so obviously I never made it to the Javits Center. I made it to my office. TV was out. Um, we had one channel from an antenna that didn't get uh, knocked down that was in Jersey. So we were able to kind of get this information. But 9-11 meant that people stopped traveling, right? So people stopped traveling. They stopped going to trade shows because everybody was afraid to fly. I mean, they used planes to take it, take, take everything down. And so that was a huge impact to my business because, like I said, first three months of the year, you know, we're, we're at trade shows. And nobody was flying. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, you're right. I, I do remember where I was, but that, like you said, everybody, especially being a New Yorker in New York, that is a, an experience. I thank you for sharing that. Um, so everybody stopped traveling. How how much longer was the business able to hang on after 9/11? Um, maybe a year at the most, I think. Um, so eventually, so that first, that first year, no, 
right? Like the first year nobody traveled, it was tough. So we went to phone sales, like we had to pivot. So we yeah. went to do phone sales and things like that. Um, so I think then come around to the next season, we were, we had a major distributor um, and he became our competition. Mm-hmm. So we were at a trade show in Vegas. Um, we would meet, we went to dinner um, and he at dinner, it was, it was like a guy breaking up with you, right? He took us to dinner and then said, you know, hey, I've sourced the product overseas. And he had helped us source the product overseas rather than having to keep, tr- keep trying to make it in-house. But we were having problems, again, because we weren't getting orders. We were having problems making orders to bring the product in. Gotcha. And so... You know, it was it began it, beca- it began to be a vicious cycle where no one's ordering. So the ones that were ordering, we couldn't fill their orders because we didn't have enough money to purchase from overseas to fill the orders. And so he he sourced it, and then eventually he just was like, um, "I'm just gonna sell." And so now imagine I'm at a trade show with who used to be my distributor selling my product and now we're in competition with each other. Yeah. And he's bigger. He has uh, a much more established network and he did not look like us. Yeah. As, as you go through that, what would you tell Karen back then And what would you advise business owners now that are especially in the distribution space? I think what I would say is don't give up. Um, It was a struggle. It was, it was hell. I I mean, we lost our biggest distributor. That was more money going out of the business. Um, and we, we, we ended up scaling back, right? So we, we got out of the big office space, um, put some stuff in storage and then moved it into a a much smaller location. Um, so that was one of the things we did. One of the other things that I did was, okay, we've got, People aren't traveling, but we can call them, right? So the next year, people decided they were going to drive to different places. You know, they weren't going to get on the planes, but they would drive like to Maryland, to the Eastern Shore, to Jersey, Atlantic City, stuff like that. And so um, we would, some of those people of our customers would still order. And then we had New York tourism was kind of coming back. And so what we did was we did that. But then I said, okay. That's mostly a summer product. When the summer season is over, we're going dark again. So how do we iterate and and keep shelf space? So at a trade show, we looked at items that we could sell for the other times of the year. And so that's when we brought in um, Christmas products, Halloween products. I'm not a fan of Halloween, but my partner was. And so it was like, okay, you know, that's a moneymaker. So we brought in Christmas, Halloween and Easter products. And uh, the goal was to hold on to the shelf space as much as possible. And we created new products. Um, I worked with, I designed a product and worked with, I think it was South Korea to make it. And then when we did the trade show the next year, people were coming back instead of having a lot of inventory we had samples took orders and then um based on those orders ordered a container load uh and if you've never unpacked an 18 wheeler a tractor trailer let me tell you something they don't look like they hold a lot but they do they hold a lot but we were able to place an order with our company name on it bring in a whole tractor trailer load. And that's a whole nother story because it was such 
it was a learning experience and an accomplishment. I'm one of the things I'm really proud about. And turn it around the same day with zero warehousing liability. So we unpacked that tractor trailer, printed out them UPS labels for them pre-orders, put them labels on there, and UPS picked it up the same day. Love it. Love it. Oh my God. So you uh if you it wouldn't even drop shipping, y'all. Y'all, y'all think that's drop shipping. You don't even know. You don't even know. Oh my God, that's amazing. That's amazing. I because so long story short, I did inside sales, hated it, but it was for a, a product based business. It was a for um it was an electrical industry, so small products, but also big industrial size. So shipping, oh my god, from the plant to that time, the customer called me to say, yeah, the, the delivery guy took it off the truck and then backed into it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was like, <sighs> so anyway, um, okay. So any, any final thoughts um, that you want to share with everybody? And then of course, letting them know where, where to find you online or in person. So you asked me what would I tell myself then? And, and my first thought was don't give up, right? But the other thought was get help. Um, I was the smartest person in the room. I was the one with the most education and all of that. And again, you know, we, we sometimes think, oh, well, I went to school, so I'm good. No, you're not good. <laughs> um, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't in a community where I could I could talk to someone and say this is what's going on, right? And get support. I didn't have a support system, um, and I didn't have people that were on the same journey as me. Um, I had one person, but he was doing like security work, so he was service based. And at that time, I was product based. Um, and even then, I didn't ask him for it. I didn't I didn't even tell him what was going on. So I bore the burden and the and the and the the guilt of that business and and struggling and not being able to pay my people. I went through all of that. I paid them before I paid myself. So yeah, get support. Um, don't carry the burden by yourself. Um, you don't need to be the smartest person in the room. Matter of fact, you, you're smarter because you admit that you're not the smartest. And there's a way through it. And if you go through it alone, you can't, you, you won't be able to succeed because you will at some point suffer so much that you just close your doors and run away. And you don't have to, especially not in this day and age. There's so much support out there. So if you're struggling, get support. I absolutely agree. So many great communities. Karen and I and Giselle are in community. That's how we met. And now mm -hmm. we're in our own community. So we crack each other up at two, three o'clock in the morning. So don't don't ask about this. Don't ask. Don't ask. Just 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 know. So Karen, where can people connect with you? I am on LinkedIn, um, Facebook, Instagram. All of them are at the Karen Eason, T-H-E-K-A-R-E-N-E-A-S-O-N. -E -E so my handle is the same on all platforms. She made it easy, y'all. She understands branding. Um, be consistent if as much as you can. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to say that because I had to go by Michelle C. Hayward because somebody else was smart enough to take Michelle Hayward before mm -hmm. I was. <laughs> Same here. Somebody's got Karen Eason. And I was like, OK, well, guess what? I need everything to match. So I couldn't get KarenEason.com. So I put the word the in front of it. I love it. I love it. Karen, I want to say thank you so much for joining me. Y'all see now. Why I was so excited to have Karen on here, but I have even more for y'all. So next week, same station, same time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, midnight if you're in London, but 4 p.m. if you're on the West Coast and wherever in between, y'all got to do the math. 
Um, I can, but we ain't got enough time. You want to join. I'm going to have the 10K project on here. So Karen, you're going to love this. So the 10K project was founded, oh my God, three, four years ago, really focused on helping Black businesses get funded. The premise is 10,000 people, 10,000 Black people giving $100 to help fund wow. and you know, fund a Black business that's already up and running or whatever. And so we're going to have the CEO, Tawana um, Rivers. We're going to have the former CTO, another friend of ours, um, Talisha Shine on. Talisha's from Pittsburgh. She's in software, does coding. She's in tech. Been there 25, 30 years. Um, they're going to be joining us. They're the some, a couple of founding members. I'm part of the 10K Project. <laughs> Really, how do you also help business to get funded? So I'm doing these two. Is it I did like, but Michelle, Black History Month over Black History Year is all is 365. If y'all ain't heard it from McDonald's, I'm gonna tell you. So, but I had some other people they ended up not being able to join, but they'll be on later this year. But really still focus on seeing black seeing women, black women in these two instances, talking about business, owning their own, growing it having their own employees, right? Because that is huge, being able not to be a solopreneur, but generating enough revenue so you can hire other people. That is a different game. That mm -hmm. is a different game. And, and I can tell you that seeing my mother doing it, me doing it, it is different. And so we're going to have the 10K project on next week. Got to put that flyer on my Instagram. Yes, you got to put that flyer on your Instagram. But and that's, I was, um, that's, sorry, Michelle, but that's a responsibility. Yes. Like people always rushing to talk about when can I hire? When can I hire? That's a responsibility. It is. You you are responsible for the living wage and earnings for someone else to take care of their family. It is not to be taken lightly. None. None whatsoever. So I'm gonna drop in here the link also for um it's called revolutionize group ep economics and in, invest in black businesses. And so definitely, definitely come join us next week. Um, if you can't just bookmark it to come check out the replay, it'll be here for you. But I really wanted to, I can't remember what happened, but I was like, I reached out to Talisha and I was like, yo, I need to talk. I want, I want us to, I want y'all to come on my platform. Y'all we've, we connected probably about the same time um, that Karen and I did, Talisha and I. And so I really wanted to be sure we amplify, like you said, community. They have a fantastic community. And it's really important to be in community, especially when you're in business. Um, so definitely, definitely check that out. We'd love to have y'all join. We're going to get out of here. We're a little bit over, but I see y'all really like Karen. I really like Karen too. Y'all see why I bring, I bring on some of my super friends, but y'all can't have them though. They mine. <laughs> you don't have to be a tech like me and Michelle. No. You just have to be open to tech. Exactly. Tech enabled. You're tech enabled, right? You got your smart, you're tech. Oh, you can't see my phone. You're tech enabled. That's all we ask. You be tech enabled. All right, everybody. I will see you next week. Karen again. Thank you. And Thank you. you're welcome. Bye, everybody.